A few dozen kilometers south of Cairo, there lie the Great Pyramids of Giza, the necropolis of Saqqara, which date back to 2500 BC. These sites are located in Lower Egypt, which is in the north of the country, near the Nile Delta, as opposed to Upper Egypt, which is in the south a region stretching from Luxor to the borders of modern-day Sudan. The first great monuments of Egyptian history were these pyramids, the earliest known of which is the Step Pyramid of Djoser at Saqqara. They were funerary monuments built for the pharaohs of the first Egyptian dynasties of the Old Kingdom. Around them, numerous members of their families and their court were buried in smaller tombs called mastabas, which were often lavishly decorated. On the left bank of the Nile, a few kilometers from the city center of Giza, which now counts 250,000 inhabitants, and 25 kilometers from Cairo, whose suburbs are creeping ever closer. The Giza Plateau remains an astonishing sight, despite the traffic of tourist buses and the countless horse-drawn carriages, merchants, and guides who approach visitors. Of course, there are the pyramids, those world-famous monuments, the tombs of the pharaohs. They continue to kindle imaginations and generate countless hypotheses about their construction, their mysteries, their curse. Giza is in fact a limestone plateau that lies around 40 meters above the Nile and is 1.9 kilometers on its long side and 1.6 kilometers on the shorter side. Its natural state was transformed by human hands, by leveling it off to enable the constructions of the pyramids, and through the accumulation of construction waste over time. The pharaohs of the fourth dynasty, who lived around the year 2500 BC, or 4,500 years ago, chose this plateau as a site for their tombs. These consisted not only of the pyramids with their vaults, but were in fact veritable funerary complexes that connected the pyramids with two temples. First, was attached to the east base of the pyramid and was used for the funeral cult that was performed every day. The second was a temple in the valley, located close to the Nile, which housed the deceased during the funeral and received all of the gifts and furnishings they would need in the afterlife. The two temples were connected by a causeway. Finally, a number of additional buildings, including pits that house boats, were included in these colossal complexes, surrounded by a wall. There were three like this on the plateau, for Khufu, Khafre and Menkura, the three pharaohs buried here. But the plateau also contains several other tombs, smaller pyramids, 
mainly for the wives of the pharaohs, and the mastabas, for the members of the court, located in cemeteries next to the pyramids. Finally, in 1990, a village was discovered that date back to the third millennium BC, with houses, bread ovens, and a large cemetery. This was the home of the laborers and craftsmen who worked on the construction of the pyramids and lived nearby. Ever since their construction, and despite the wear and tear of time, these pyramids have always been admired and studied with much curiosity. Greek, Roman, Arab and European authors have described and tried to explain these monuments. With General Bonaparte's expedition in Egypt between 1789 and 1801, the scientists who accompanied him began a more in-depth and rigorous study. Travellers and explorers kept coming throughout the 19th century, including the English painter David Roberts, who made a trip in 1883 and made several hundred drawings and watercolours. Very impressed by everything he saw, he noted in his diary, we are tiny people visiting a nation of giants. Since then, the Giza Plateau and its multiple monuments have been constantly scrutinised down to the smallest detail. Not much is known about the pharaoh Khufu, aside from that he reigned from around 2590 to 2565 BC. On the other hand, he clearly managed to ensure his posthumous glory. During his reign, the Giza Plateau was chosen as the site of his funerary complex. Although there are no longer any traces of the other structures that were part of the complex, the pyramid remains the largest ever built in Egypt and was one of the wonders of the ancient world. The project was probably completed towards the end of the 23rd year of Khufu's reign. For over 40 centuries, the Pyramid of Khufu was the highest monument ever built by man. It now measures 137 metres high, but it must have reached 146 metres when it had the limestone coating that gave it a completely smooth surface. The size of the base measure 230 metres. Altogether, it makes up a massive structure of over 2 million stone blocks, assembled by hand using only very simple tools. At the time, the Egyptians knew of neither metal nor the wheel and each block weighs at least two and a half tons. Inside, there are several corridors and some rooms, including the one containing the sarcophagus, which are all integrated into the mass of the pyramid itself. There are still many questions about what techniques they could have used to build such monuments. The monument has strikingly perfect proportions. There is less than five centimetres difference between the sides or in the levelling of the plateau supporting this colossus. 
their engineers knew the measurements perfectly. We're also able to orientate correctly, with each side facing one of the cardinal directions. This period, like those that came before it, marked the implementation of a sophisticated funerary belief system, which at the time concerned only the king and his wives. It was believed that his mummified body would continue to live in his tomb, while his spiritual principles would unite with the sun, with the shape of the pyramid representing petrified rays of the god Ra. meters from the Pyramid of Khufu, there stands the Pyramid of his son, Khafre, the fourth pharaoh of the fourth dynasty, who reigned between 2558 and 2553 BC. It can be easily recognised because it has retained the white limestone coating on its tip. Because of that, and because it was placed on the higher area of the plateau, it seems almost as large as the Pyramid of Khufu, which was not the case during antiquity. Like all pyramids, it was only the most spectacular piece of a funerary complex built for the king. With two temples, a causeway, as well as a small secondary pyramid that may have contained his spiritual double, Ka. Two pits that must have held the solar boats used for the funerary rituals. And finally, a row of 90 cells that perhaps housed the workers needed for building the complex. The interior of the pyramid is accessed from the northern side. Then, you have to go through a passageway that after several detours leads to the funeral chamber on ground level, which contains a granite sarcophagus and its lid broken by looters during antiquity. These pyramids were covered with a very smooth white coating, which made them visible from dozens of kilometers away. It is also known that the Pyramid of Khufu at least had the tip coated with electrum, a blend of gold and silver, to make the pyramid shine even brighter in the sun. There is no sign that the Pyramid of Khafre did not also have the same thing. The last pyramid was built from Menkure, the son and successor to Khafre. It was not entirely completed until after the death of the pharaoh, as indicated by an inscription near the entrance. Much smaller than the two previous pyramids, it still measures 106 meters on each side and rises 62 meters high. It had a coating made of fine limestone on the upper portion and pink granite on the lower portion, some pieces of which still remain. Placed a few dozen meters from the two large pyramids, the Sphinx continues to cause much discussion among specialists. It was made from a rock that had an evocative shape and was finished off with limestone blocks to refine the contours. It represents a monstrous being, a crouching lion with a human head, and is considered an image of the sun god 
Ra Horakti, the protector of the pharaoh. Some consider the Great Sphinx at Giza a portrait of Khafre, while others think it is one of Khufu, made during the reign of his son, Jedfre, the elder brother of Khafre. The prestige of this sphinx grew to such a point that it began to be worshipped itself. Temples were built to it, and the pharaoh Tutmosis IV had a stele placed between the paws of the Sphinx to thank it for placing him on the throne of Egypt in 1396 BC, after he had removed the sand from it. Unfortunately, this masterful work suffered horrible affronts due to the mediocre quality of the stone and to erosion, but also to human idiocy. Its nose was destroyed by soldiers during the Middle Ages, who used it for target practice. Today, the Sphinx is under constant surveillance because pollution and the water table are making it more fragile every day. Let's take one final look at one of the most important sites of the oldest civilization in Egypt before we leave for Saqqara to the south of Giza. Twenty-eight kilometers south of Cairo, Saqqara is the name of the necropolis of Memphis, one of the great capitals of Egypt's old kingdom. We are in Lower Egypt, and the city is said to have been founded by King Menes, one of the very first pharaohs of Egyptian civilization perhaps mythical. The city served as the capital of Egypt for several hundred years. Next to the city, several necropolises were built, the largest of which is Saqqara. In all, it stretched over eight kilometres in length was used during multiple periods. The most ancient tombs date from the very beginning of the 3rd millennium BC, to a time when the main characteristics of the Egyptian funerary religion were being established. Starting in 2700 BC, the pharaohs were buried in a very specific monument, the pyramid. The oldest one is the step pyramid of Djoser. It was followed by many others, as we have a count of 15 royal tombs between the 3rd and the 6th dynasty. Unfortunately, most of them have been badly damaged. All around, there are many tombs of the nobility and courtiers close to the pharaohs. They are all built on the model of Mastaba, which is sort of a quadrangular block that is quite low, named after the Arabic word for bench. characteristic of the Old Kingdom, these tombs contain veritable treasures of sculpture and painting, even if in most cases they were thoroughly looted during antiquity and hardly contain any objects or furnishings anymore. Saqqara was used as a funeral site for hundreds of years as there are numerous tombs from the New Empire and even the late period, from the start of the first millennium BC. The funerary complex of Josea is the main monument of the necropolis.
It was surrounded by a gigantic enclosing wall, around 10 meters high and encircling an area of 15 hectares. Unfortunately, only a few pieces of it remain. In particular, a small part of the long eastern wall with the sole entrance. It was a wall with reddens, meaning it featured protrusions that made it look more massive. Made of stone, it also had simple decorations all along the sides. The entrance is surprisingly narrow, which confirms the fortified aspect of the complex. It is located in the southeast corner of the wall. In fact, this was the only way in. There were 14 other false doors, which only the Ka, the vital power of the pharaoh, could use. The courtyard is accessed through a corridor bordered by two rows of 20 columns each. Built by assembling narrow drums, these massive fluted columns were in fact the outermost edges of walls separating small rooms, possibly chapels. They supported a heavy stone ceiling. Here and there, you can see some traces of red paint that evoke the bundles of reeds that were often used as a support. The corridor opens onto a small columned room that leads to a large courtyard to the south of the pyramid. Like the one to the east of the pyramid, this courtyard is strewn with stones that once belonged to the various monuments that were there. In fact, King Jose had several buildings built around the pyramid. Numerous chapels containing the gods of Upper and Lower Egypt, which played a role in the festival of Hetzeb during which the pharaoh celebrated the jubilee of 30 years of his reign and received regenerative properties. Joseph believed that these ceremonies would endure even after his death. He had also prepared a second tomb to the south and a funeral temple to the north. Each of them contained several ground level and underground rooms. Egyptologists still debate the role of his second tomb. Was it for the entrails or for the car, the king's spiritual double? Or does it foreshadow the satellite pyramids found in later funerary complexes? these monuments, like the pyramid, contain subterranean levels, reached through multiple corridors that sometimes go very deep underground. Some of them were visited during antiquity, but others were discovered untouched in the 20th century and yielded several vases and a statue of the king. The heart of this complex is the Pyramid of Jose. It has the special trait of being a stepped pyramid and is the oldest known pyramid of the Egyptian civilization. According to legend, it was built by Aminotep, the Grand Visa of the Pharaoh, who was also a man of such legendary wisdom 
that eventually he was defied and became the protector of the scribes. Amenhotep was the originator of the double architectural revolution that resulted in the pyramid. On one hand, he started from the Mastaba, a traditional funeral monument at the time, a kind of rectangular block with straight walls, and he made it at least twice as big, which created the lower base of the pyramid. Then, he built the upper levels, set back, forming a steep pyramid, a kind of colossal stairway, allowing the pharaohs to reach the world of the gods. This was in response to the symbolism from the cult of the sun and the concept they had of the afterlife at the time. The second, and no less important revolution achieved by Amenhotep, was that he built this structure entirely from stone, eliminating the use of mud bricks and thus ensuring the longevity of the monument. The heart of the structure was made from roughly cut stones, filled in with beds of cut stone at regular intervals. The whole thing was covered with a smooth white limestone cladding that must have been visible from far away. Behind this pyramid, there is a funeral temple with corridors that lead down towards the royal tomb dug 28 metres deep and the underground passages of the pyramid. There are also 11 shafts carved out of the interior of the pyramid itself made during one of the expansions of the initial mastaba. These shafts lead to galleries, some of which serve as tombs for members of the royal family. At the foot of the funerary enclosure, which has now disappeared, mastabas were built on various sides, especially towards the south. The deceased who were buried there were thus alongside the pharaoh in death, as they had certainly been in life. These courtiers may have also benefited from the proximity of another pyramid, the Pyramid of King Unas, who reigned during 2340 to 2350 BC, and was the last king of the Fifth Dynasty. It was thus built long after the Pyramid of Djoser, and even after those of Giza. Today it is very damaged, but it has retained some pieces of its limestone cladding. It nevertheless has been very important for our current understanding of the pyramids. Archaeologists have managed to find traces of the great causeway that connected the lower temple near a lake in the valley to the upper temple next to the pyramid. Covered but very slightly illuminated by a slit between the two covering stones, it was decorated with painted reliefs across its entire 700 meters. According to various miraculously well-conserved inscriptions, we know that the funerary cult of Unas required at least seven priests to carry out its rites in the temple of the funerary complex. This continued until the end of the Old Kingdom, around 150 years later. Egyptian beliefs were not just empty words. Among the other pyramids of Saqqara, the Pyramid of Teti is interesting, despite its ruined state.
created for the first pharaoh of the 6th dynasty, around the year 3300. It must have been 78 meters per side and 52 meters high. Through a stairway dug into the ground next to it, you can access the intact funeral chamber. The walls bear a long series of engraved hieroglyphs, the Egyptian form of writing that have already been in use for hundreds of years. These inscriptions make up what is called the Book of the Pyramids. They include magical phrases, elements of rituals and hymns, intended to give the deceased what he needed to survive the purification of the soul and to overcome obstacles in the underworld. It is in fact an ancestor to the Book of the Dead. In the vault, beneath a starry sky, the sarcophagus carved out of a large block of basalt is still preserved. It is larger than the entrance, which would imply that it was placed in the vault while it was still under construction. The pyramid is surrounded by mastabas, tombs made for the high officials and priests who surrounded the pharaoh and had become increasingly powerful and important figures at the time. This was particularly the case for Kagemni, who began his career under Unes and ended up as a vizier, high priest of Ra at Heliopolis, chief judge and overseer of the pyramid during the reign of Teti. He had a very large mastaba, built with lavish decorations. Carving the stone to bring out shapes that protrude very slightly, the sculptors were able to add numerous details by making incisions and modulations to the surface of the stone. You can see muscles, facial traits, and details of plants and animals. It feels like a picture book. An entire sequence is dedicated to fishing on the Nile. The deceased is standing on a large boat, although only his feet and legs are visible, and is accompanied by his wife, who is very small, as per tradition. He is accompanied by servants who fish and hunt hippopotamus. The fish are depicted with an astonishing quality. You can recognize all of them. One of the other themes is animal life. Cow herds push a herd of cows to cross a ford. In the front, a calf attached to the boat looks to see if its mother is following, bringing with it the entire herd. And in the back, a cow herd carries a calf attached to his back. You can also see that the animals were carefully tied up to be milked. And that pigs were domesticated from a very early age. These reliefs are swarming with practical information about Egyptian agricultural practices. After the first large hall, there are several smaller rooms bearing many decorations that show the offerings brought to the deceased during his funeral.
Kegemni is always depicted in a monumental scale compared to the other figures. He wears a kind of kilt with a stiff front, a large necklace, and is holding the long staff of command and a scepter, symbols of his power and authority. His short wig and his beard were very fashionable at the time. In front of him, the servants approach bearing offerings. You can recognise dried fish, poultry, especially geese, which the Egyptians already force-fed and particularly appreciated. Lotus flowers, symbols of rebirth, other baskets containing breads and wafers and vases of beer. A little further on, bound animals with their heads upside down wait to be sacrificed. The false door stile was an essential part of these tombs. It allowed the deceased, whose body lay in the subterranean chamber beneath his room, to enjoy the food and refreshments placed on the offering table in front of it. All over, there are hieroglyphics, depictions of the deceased, prayers and ritual formulas, invoking Kegemni's joy in the realm of the dead. The tomb of Ankhamor, another visa of Teti, is smaller but has seen an increase in popularity for some years now. It is known as the Tomb of the Doctor because it contains scenes of medical practices. The tomb only has seven rooms, including one with pillars, which unfortunately suffered a lot of damage and lost almost all of its walls. However, many inscriptions were found on the pillars there, with delicately carved hieroglyphics, and they still bear many traces of the blue colouring that used to adorn them. The usual scenes of everyday life are found here. Shepherds guiding herds or helping a cow to carve. Servants fill baskets with bread, which had a conical shape in ancient Egypt. The reason these scenes are depicted in the tombs is to recount the life of the deceased in the afterlife, which appears exactly the same as this world. In other rooms, processions of offerings decorate the walls. Finally, like in every mastaba, the false door stile allows communication with the deceased. He is depicted here twice, framing the door itself, which bears the ritual phrases. He is also depicted before the offering table, garnished with feathers to symbolize justice and several elementary offerings. These images had a real magical power, ensuring the perpetuity of these rites, even if the living forgot them. This is why they are constantly found in virtually every tomb. Finally, a number of these reliefs concern the funeral banquet, which was held at the time of the funeral. The deceased and his wife await the victuals that are being prepared on the adjacent wall. In particular, you can see the preparation of the poultry, which are caught in the aviaries and then force-fed before being killed.
Mastabas of the royal family and high officials were built all around, gradually forming something like a village between the various pyramids. Some of these tombs have known somewhat troubled fates. Like the tomb of Idet, which was initially constructed for a visor of King Unas, but it was usurped by the Princess Udet, probably one of the daughters of the pharaoh. While the layout of the rooms and reliefs conform to tradition, a few variations provide some information about life in ancient Egypt. For example, the role of the administration is clearly detailed. Scribes take note of the taxes that people bring and watch out for non-prayers who are beaten. Scenes of fishing in the swamp, hunting hippopotamus, or the herd fording a river are so similar they could be mistaken for those in Kagmenni's tune. They also have the same finesse in their details and the same realism in the depiction of the animals. Only five of the ten rooms in the Mastaba are decorated. Most of them show numerous scenes of offerings that can be quickly identified. Processions of servants bringing all kinds of victuals and drinks. Tables covered with food. The reliefs are very light here. Artists obeyed the conventions established since the beginning of Egyptian art. The figures are depicted in profile, in a walking pose, with the torso and the eye facing forward, and men have okra red skin, whereas the women's skin is lighter. Many of the reliefs have retained their colours, showing that the Egyptians already had quite a developed palette. Let's move a few metres away, and a few millennia later, passing by the Persian tombs, to visit the great catacomb of the sacred bulls. This was where sacred bulls, the image of the god Apis on Earth, was buried in an extraordinary ceremony in a special complex called the Serapium. Above ground, there is a large walkway lined with sphinxes that led to a temple dedicated to Osiris Apis. Nothing remains of it today. On the other hand, the catacombs have remained intact. These catacombs were one of the many places for tombs of animals in Saqqara. Apart from bulls, they also buried cats, dedicated to the goddess Bastet, and ibis, baboons, cows, As for the bulls, the animals were worshipped in Memphis, the large city across from Saqqara, and the cult spread throughout the region. The animal, called Apis, was assimilated with Osiris and became the god Osiris Apis. The bulls were carefully chosen for their precise qualities and were worshipped in the temple at Saqqara. When they died, they were mummified and buried in the catacomb below the temple. 
it was thanks to a text by the ancient geographer Strabon that the French archaeologist Auguste Mariette was able to discover the Serapium of Saqqara in 1851. It was built by two pharaohs of the New Kingdom between the 14th and 13th century BC, more than 1,000 years after the pyramids. The first tunnel was later enlarged and paired with a second tunnel, which remained in use until the end of antiquity and the rise of Christianity. It is a long corridor punctuated by small chambers that contain colossal sarcophagi. Usually made of granite, they often weighed more than 70 tons. Some of them have high quality engraved decorations. This was where the mummified balls were placed, along with funerary items similar to those found in human tombs, jewellery, amulets, and small statues of servants of the dead. Once the bull was buried, the chamber was closed with a wall on which they placed dedication stile that gave information about the bull. The French writer and traveller, Pierre Loti, visiting the Serapium in 1906, asked many questions that still resonate with us today. What sort of titans could have carved out these coffins century after century and then brought them underground and finally placed them in rows in these chambers where they are all here as if lying in wait for us in ambush? Saqqara thus represents a veritable history book of Egyptian civilization across the millennia. Egypt appears in many forms, each as fascinating as the last. These monuments that continue to defy time were built for various reasons, with funerary pyramids and mastabas, animal necropolises, religious temples, sphinxes, and painted artistic reliefs. However, despite all the distances between them, their designers and artists maintained a true artistic and stylistic unity and homogeneity that the, even the Greek and Roman invaders did not break, probably as fascinated as we are today by the splendour of these testaments to the past. <laughs>